proteins and you want to be extremely wonderful I suggest you watch that video before this one it'll definitely help you understand prions and proteins much better proteins are obviously extremely important to our everyday life but what happens when these proteins decide to become a killer some proteins even though extremely rare can misfold from these really weird proteins called prions these proteins actually misfold other properly folded proteins causing an exponential chain reaction of misfolded proteins and they all end up binding together in an infected person, these proteins are located in the brain and cause neural issues and death quite quickly. These neurological disorders are known as transmissible spongiform encephalopathies, or TSEs for short. They are a group of the rarest diseases and have the highest mortality rate on the planet, with 100%. There are no known cures and no treatments available. TSEs are extremely scary. Did I mention that these proteins can't be denatured by proteases? enzymes, heat, radiation, and even autoclaves, which heat up to 134 degrees Celsius in a pressurized steam chamber for 18 minutes and are meant to kill any and all bacteria and viruses? So now that I've scared you, how do you get this horrific disease? It's quite complicated and of course more research needs to go into it, but there are several ways we think we can get it. It starts off knowing that there is a cow version of the disease. You've probably heard of it, mad cow disease. If humans eat beef infected with the prions and the prion makes it to the brain, it can start causing the disease. It's also thought that if humans come in contact with manure or urine from the infected cows, they have a chance of being infected with the prions. The cows get it the same way humans do, by eating infected meat. The good news is that the U.S. banned the practice of feeding cattle other cow parts in 1997. Kuru was another version in which human cannibalism can cause it. As gross as this might sound, it's mostly the people who eat the brain. There's also an even rarer genetic version. Personally, I think the genetic version is by far the scariest. It causes progressively worsening insomnia, which leads to delirium and a confused state of dementia. You get so sleepy that you go crazy and eventually die. Luckily, TSEs are extremely rare and only affect about one out of every million people each year. Even though prions and the diseases they cause are extremely scary, we have a lot of preventative measures to keep them hopefully out of the population. More research needs to be done on the prions to understand the ways to combat them and possible treatments for the issues they cause. Just be glad that your proteins didn't decide to go rogue.
Cholera is a disease that causes acute watery diarrhea, but the symptoms can range from none or very mild symptoms, very mild diarrhea with few episodes and little volume, to incredible amounts of acute watery diarrhea and associated vomiting as well, where people can lose up to 10, 20 liters of water per day. The main modes of transmission of cholera is through infected food or water, mainly through water that is not clean. It would be anything from a pump, to a river where the water is infected, where people go and either search water for drinking, for cooking, for showering, and they will ingest a certain amount at some point in time during that process. MSF sees cholera in several contexts, usually associated to the lack of access to clean water. We can see this in areas where cholera is endemic, like many countries in Africa or in the Indian subcontinent, and also associated to either living conditions or natural disasters, like we saw after the earthquake in Haiti or the, the more recent hurricane in Haiti, or like we could see in, in refugee camp settings or in other areas where there's overcrowding and lack of access to clean water. You can test for suspicion of cholera using a rapid diagnostic test, but confirmation will need to happen in a lab in order to confirm that there is an outbreak. Once an outbreak is ongoing, not every case needs to be confirmed, but every case will need to be treated. If within an outbreak you have people presenting with acute watery diarrhea, you will consider them as cases of cholera. In the case of a cholera outbreak, MSF will do different interventions. So in the case of a mild disease with little episodes of diarrhea or little volume of diarrhea, the person can receive oral fluids, usually with oral rehydration salts, which are a mix of salt, uh, some sugar and electrolytes to replenish what's being lost through the diarrhea to intravenous fluids. So a person of 70 kilos or about 150 pounds would be, need anything from 7 to 20 liters a day, so from 2, 4, or 5 gallons of fluids per day. There are currently three different vaccines for cholera with an effectiveness of about 65% for up to five years after vaccine. The Gulf of Kambat, also known as the Gulf of Cambay, is a bay on the Arabian Sea coast of India, bordering the state of Gujarat. The Gulf of Kambat is about 200 kilometers (120 miles) long, about 20 kilometers (12 miles) wide in the north and up to 70 kilometers (43 miles) wide in the south. Major rivers draining Gujarat are the Narmada, Tapti, Mahi and Sabarmati that form estuaries in the Gulf. It divides the Kathiawar Peninsula from the southeastern part of Gujarat. There are plans to construct a 30 kilometer, 19 miles dam, Kalpasar project across the Gulf. Topic Rift Valley Formation A rift valley is formed as a result of the sinking of a portion of the crust between cracks on the surface of the earth.
there are three stages in the formation of a rift valley. Stage 1. Layers of rock are subject to tension or stress. Stage 2. Faults or cracks develop in the layers and the central block begins to subside. Stage 3. After subsidence, a depression with steep sides is formed. This is a rift valley.
February 9, 1945, in Fukuoka, Japan. He received a B. Psi, in 1967 and a D. Psi, in 1974, both from the University of Tokyo. In 1974–77 he was a postdoctoral fellow at the Rockefeller University in New York City. He returned to the University of Tokyo in 1977 as a research associate. He was appointed lecturer there in 1986, and promoted to associate professor in 1988. In 1996 he moved to the National Institute for Basic Biology in Okazaki City, Japan, where he was appointed as a professor. From 2004 to 2009 he was also professor at the Graduate University for Advanced Studies in Hayama, Japan. In 2009 he transitioned to a three-way appointment as an emeritus professor at the National Institute for Basic Biology and at the Graduate University for Advanced Studies, and a professorship at the Advanced Research Organization, Integrated Research Institute, Tokyo Institute of Technology Tokyo Tech. After his retirement in 2014, he continued to serve as professor at Institute of Innovative Research, Tokyo Institute of Technology. Currently, he is head of the Cell Biology Research Unit, Institute of Innovative Research, Tokyo Institute of Technology. Christian de Duve coined the term autophagy in 1963, whereas Osumi began his work in 1988. Prior to that time, less than 20 papers per year were published on this subject. During the 1990s, Osumi's group described the morphology of autophagy in yeast, and performed mutational screening on yeast cells that identified essential genes for cells to be capable of autophagy. In 2016, he was awarded the Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine for his discoveries of mechanisms for autophagy. He is the 25th Japanese person to be awarded a Nobel Prize. Osumi's spouse Mariko, a professor of Taikyo University of Science, collaborated on his research. Okay, so the last paper in the session is um, now again moving away from mobile. Now we are focusing on more laptops or let's say every device where we need encrypted RAM. So the presentation will be by Lian Jin Zhao from Concordia University. Shanka Ghosh born the 5th of February 1932 is a Bengali Indian poet and critic. Ghosh got his undergraduate degree in arts in Bengali language from the Presidency College Kolkata in 1951 and subsequently his master's degree from the University of Calcutta in the year 1954. He taught at many educational institutions including Bangabasi College, City College, all affiliated to the University of Calcutta and at Jadaspur University all in Kolkata. He retired from Jadaspur University in 1992. In 1967, he participated in the International Writing Program's Fall Residency at the University of Iowa in Iowa City, Iowa. He has also taught at Delhi University, the Indian Institute of Advanced Studies at Shimla, and at the Visva Bharati University. He has won a number of prestigious awards including Jnanpith Award in 2016. His pain name is Kuntik. Poem
here again. Around October, the Nobel Prize winners are announced, and a few scientists around the world are specially honored for their discoveries. Olivia talked about the Physiology or Medicine Prize last week, and now it's Chemistry and Physics' turn. This year's Chemistry Prize was shared between three researchers who all used molecules to make tiny machines. Over billions of years of evolution, nature has come up with lots of molecular machines, from whip-like flagella that help cells move, to enzymes that catalyze chemical reactions. These researchers haven't had that kind of time, but their microscopic tools could still have a big impact on the future. First up is the chemist Jean-Pierre Sauvage, who wanted to see if molecules could be mechanically connected. Normally, different molecules are connected by covalent chemical bonds between their atoms. But Sauvage and his team used copper ions to coax molecules into interlocking, like links in a chain, which they call a catenane. This new way of linking molecules could be used as part of a bigger microscopic machine, like a switch or a motor. The researchers even created a simple mechanical system where adding a bit of energy made one ring revolve around the other. The second winner, J. Fraser Stoddart, synthesized two different molecules that can be linked together as one machine axles and ring. The axle is basically a rod with bulky ends and two middle bits packed full of electrons, while the slightly open ring didn't have many electrons. Opposites attract, so the electron-poor rings threaded onto the electron-rich rods when they were mixed. Then the team sealed up the rings with a chemical reaction to mechanically lock them onto the axles, creating these structures called rotaxanes. By adding some heat, the team could shuttle the rings along the rods and make tiny machines that worked like elevators, muscles, and even computer chips. Lastly, the third scientist, Ben Faringha, built a tiny molecular motor. Free molecules are always getting jostled around, so they tend to spin left and right randomly. But Faringha's team built a molecule out of two flat structures that locked together, so when they added UV light and heat, it only spun in one direction. The group's first attempts in 1999 weren't all that speedy, but by 2014, they had a molecular motor that spun at 12 million revolutions per second. They even built a nanocar with four motors for wheels, which zipped forward across a surface. So all these basic machines are neat ways to make molecules spin and slide, but they're still just the beginning. As scientists work to combine them or build entirely new structures, who knows what microscopic technologies we'll be building in the future. Now I remember that uh, what the long drought is finally over. Scotland's Andy Murray defeated rival Novak Djokovic on Sunday to become the first British man to win Wimbledon in 77 years. After Djokovic staved off three match points and a nail-biting finish, the 26-year-old Murray claimed victory to win the title in three sets, 6-4, 7-5, and 6-4. Murray's Wimbledon victory is the first time a British male has held the title since Fred Perry's win in 1936. He remains ranked as the number two tennis player in the world behind Djokovic. Murray himself couldn't seem to believe his victory, telling the BBC's Sue Barker he didn't remember anything about the match point. I have no idea what happened. <laughs> I really don't know what happened. It was, I, I don't know how long that last game was, but I can't even remember. I'm sorry, that's, that's, that's how, how well I was concentrating. The car felt strange afterwards, so um, maybe there was some some uh, offset or something, uh, some, something, something on the rear tire. But I was giving it everything, and it felt good still, nevertheless, in the race. So um, yeah, I was able to come back all the way to third, which is uh, quite amazed. I didn't think that would have.
A zone plate is a device used to focus light or other things exhibiting wave character. Unlike lenses or curved mirrors however, zone plates use diffraction instead of refraction or reflection. Based on analysis by August and Jean Fresnel, they are sometimes called Fresnel zone plates in his honor. The zone plate's focusing ability is an extension of the Arago spot phenomenon caused by diffraction from an opaque disk. A zone plate consists of a set of radially symmetric rings, known as Fresnel zones, which alternate between opaque and transparent. Light hitting the zone plate will diffract around the opaque zones. The zones can be spaced so that the diffracted light constructively interferes at the desired focus, creating रीनियस थ्योरी के अनुसार एसिड्स वो सब्सटेंसेस यानी पदार्थ होते हैं जो किसी सॉल्यूशन में प्रोटॉन और बेसिस हाइड्रोक्साइड आयन रिलीज करते हैं हम जानते हैं कि अमोनिया बेस की तरह बिहेव करती है और एल्कलाइन प्रॉपर्टीज एग्जिबिट यानी प्रदर्शित करती है लेकिन इनमें हाइड्रोक्साइड आय नहीं होते तो फिर ये बेस कैसे हुआ इस वीडियो में हम एसिड्स और बेसिस की ब्रॉन्स्टेड लॉरी थियोरी की स्टडी करेंगे ये थियोरी अरिनियस थियोरी की कमी को दूर करेगी आपने पहले ही पढ़ा है की एसिड्स की पी वैल्यू सात से कम होती है एसिड्स का टेस्ट हम यूनिवर्सल इंडिकेटर सॉल्यूशन या लिटमस पेपर की मदद से करते हैं एसिड्स अपनी स्ट्रेंथ के अनुसार यूनिवर्सल इंडिकेटर सॉल्यूशन का लिटमस पेपर को रेड या ऑरेंज कलर में बदल देते हैं एसिड्स की प्रेजेंस में ब्लू लिटमस पेपर भी रेड में बदल जाता है यहाँ पे हम हाइड्रोक्लोरिक एसिड का एग्जाम्पल लेके इसे समझेंगे हाइड्रोजन क्लोराइड पानी में घुल के हाइड्रोक्लोरिक एसिड देता है हाइड्रोजन क्लोराइड डिसोसिएट होकर टूट के प्रोटोन और क्लोराइड आयन देगा प्रोटॉन रिलीज नहीं होता लेकिन ये किसी दूसरे सब्सटेंस जिसे वाटर में ट्रांसफर हो जाता है वाटर प्रोटॉन एक्सेप्ट करके हाइड्रोनियम आयन बनाता है हाइड्रोनियम आयन को ऑक्सोनियम आयन भी कहा जाता है ब्रॉन्स्टेड लॉरी एसिड्स वो सब्सटेंसेस होते हैं जो किसी सोल्यूशन में प्रोटॉन्स डोनेट करते हैं यहाँ पे इस केस में हाइड्रोजन क्लोराइड ब्रॉन्स्टेड लॉरी एसिड की तरह बिहेव कर रहा है ब्रॉन्स्टेड लॉरी बेसिस वो सब्सटेंसेस होते हैं जो किसी सॉल्यूशन के प्रोटॉन्स को एक्सेप्ट करते हैं यहाँ पे सॉल्यूशन वाटर है ध्यान देने वाली बात यह है कि ब्रॉन्स्टेड लॉरी एसिड्स का बेसिस की डेफिनेशन में पीएच वैल्यू इन्वॉल्व नहीं है ब्रॉन्स्टेड लॉरी थियोरी के अनुसार एसिड बेस रिएक्शन में प्रोटोन्स एक सब्सटेंस से दूसरे सब्सटेंस में ट्रांसफर होते हैं वीडियो की शुरुआत में अरिनियस थियोरी में हमने बताया था कि अमोनिया हाइड्रोक्साइड आयन रिलीज नहीं करता फिर भी ये बेस की तरह बिहेव करता है वाटर में जब अमोनिया घुलती है तो ये वाटर से प्रोटॉन को एक्सेप्ट करती है ध्यान दीजिए कि इस रिएक्शन में भी प्रोटॉन का ट्रांसफर हो रहा है इस एग्जाम्पल में आप क्या देख सकते हैं कि कौन सा सब्सटेंस एसिड और कौन सा सब्सटेंस बेस की तरह बिहेव कर रहा है वीडियो रोक के इस पे विचार करें इस एग्जाम्पल में वॉटर प्रोटोन रिलीज कर रहा है इसलिए ये ब्रॉन्स्टेड लॉरी एसिड की तरह बिहेव कर रहा है प्रोटोन एक्सेप्ट करने के कारण अमोनिया ब्रॉन्स्टेड लॉरी बेस की तरह बिहेव कर रही है ब्रॉन्स्टेड लॉरी थियोरी के अनुसार बेस होने के लिए ये जरूरी नहीं कि उनकी पीएच वैल्यू सात से ज्यादा हो या वो सब्सटेंस रेड लिटमस पेपर को ब्लू करें या यूनिवर्सल इंडिकेटर सॉल्यूशन या लिटमस पेपर को ब्लू या पर्पल कलर में बदले ब्रॉन्स्टेड लॉरी थियोरी के अनुसार बेसिस सिर्फ प्रोटोन को एक्सेप्ट करते हैं क्या आपने इस बात पर ध्यान दिया की हमारे पहले एग्जाम्पल में वॉटर बेस की तरह बिहेव कर रहा था लेकिन दूसरे एग्जाम्पल में वही वॉटर एसिड की तरह बिहेव कर रहा था वो सब्सटेंसेस जो एसिड और बेस दोनों की तरह बिहेव करते हैं उन्हें एम्फोटेरिक यानी उभय धर्मी कहते हैं आइए एक बार जल्दी से समरी देखते हैं ब्रॉन्स्टेड लॉरी थियोरी के अनुसार एसिड्स वो सब्सटेंसेस होते हैं जो डिसोसिएट होकर प्रोटॉन्स रिलीज करते हैं ब्रॉन्स्टेड लॉरी बेसिस वो सब्सटेंसेज होते हैं जो प्रोटोन्स को एक्सेप्ट करते हैं इस तरह हम कह सकते हैं कि किसी एसिड बेस रिएक्शन में प्रोटोन
DDT. DDT, or dichlorodiphenyl trichloroethane, was a popular modern synthetic insecticide used for insect control in crops, livestock production, in households, and in gardens. How DDT works is that it messes with the neurons of the insect. In regular circumstances in neurons and axons, the action potential usually progresses down the axon as a negative wave, formed as sodium channels open to allow sodium diffusion into the axon. The purpose of this is to allow for depolarization of inside and outside the axon. The sodium ions are then pumped back out through the pump once the action potential wave passes. However, in the case of DDT, it binds onto and holds open the sodium channels. The sodium ions enter the axon continuously, producing excessive amounts of action potential. This results in hyperpolarization of the membrane. The charge on the axon's membrane disappears as the number of diffusible ions outside and inside the cell has reached equilibrium. At the neuron level, these ions begin to fire spontaneously, sending uncontrolled messages throughout the body, leading to spasms and eventual death. The more DDT, the more the nervous system overloads. DDT was first synthesized in 1874, but started its uprise in the 1940s, though it was initially used to fight malaria, typhus, and other insect-borne illnesses during World War II, it became the most popular pesticide in day-to-day -day life for its effectivity, how long-lasting it was in the environment, and how inexpensive it was to manufacture. DDT's persistence in the environment was thought to be a great asset in the fight against insect abundance, until people began to realize its effects on other life forms. The effectivity of DDT was short-lived, as many insect species quickly developed a resistance to the pesticide. A mutation in their genes allowed them to metabolize DDT until it was no longer toxic. Insects then passed down this trait to their many offspring. DDT eventually ended up in the food chain, and animals at the top of the food chain received the highest concentration of DDT. This biological effect is called biomagnification. The most affected were birds. Because of DDT solubility in water, but extreme solubility in organic solvents and fats, the chemical eventually made its way into the water, absorbed by arthropods, which were then eaten by fish, DDT being stored in their fats. The fish were then eaten by predatory birds like bald eagles. Over the years, bald eagles populations severely decreased, and it was found that their eggs had become so brittle that when the mother bird went to incubate it, the egg would break under the slight weight of their body. Smaller birds like robins would be affected through eating and feeding to their young, the earthworms, ones who live in and consume the DDT-saturated soil. Just like bald eagles and other birds of prey, these small birds' eggs were found brittle or broken. Rachel Carson researched and analyzed this effect and published her book Silent Springs in 1962, exposing DDT's harsh effect on other life forms, especially birds. Carson's groundbreaking book and exposition of the harmful consequences DDT brings led to the complete ban of DDTs in the U.S. in 1972. DDT was regulated due to its disadvantages overpowering the benefits it seemed to provide and its detriments to the environment. It's known as a pro-vitamin A carotenoid because it needs to be converted to active vitamin A by the body. Researchers agree that beta-carotene found in fruits and vegetables is beneficial to your health. These specific vitamin A foods can help to boost your immune system, protect your skin and eyes, and fight life-threatening conditions like heart disease and cancer. and that contain hydrolytic enzymes. One example is peroxidases, and here we see the chemical reaction called peroxidases that destroy highly toxic and destructive peroxides like hydrogen peroxide that are generated as lysosomes usually and contain fewer different hydrolytic enzymes. One example is peroxisomes, which are particularly rich in enzymes called peroxidases that destroy highly toxic and destructive peroxides like hydrogen peroxide that are generated as a byproduct of some biochemical reactions. And here we see the chemical reaction in which two molecules of H2O2 are broken down into two molecules of water and a molecule of oxygen gas.
An isolate of vesicles from cells expected to contain peroxisomes can be identified by showing that they break down added peroxides. Though not shown, an isolate of putative lysosomes can be characterized by assaying them for any one of a variety of hydrolytic enzymes.